so it's about time to get started. We'll give uh, a couple more minutes if anybody else can mosey in. It's like post lunch. It's like post lunch day two. Everybody's kind of like a little. <laughs> So with that, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so first off, like, how many of y'all have ever heard of scale computing before? All right. Well, people, wow, we're famous. This is amazing. So I'm uh, I'm Jason Collier. I'm one of the one of the founders here at Scale. Uh, I used to be the CTO, and I determined that that job was too difficult, so I uh, gave that up to my chief architect, and now I. Uh, Literally, usually just change my title every couple of weeks, depending on what suits me. Uh, I think the latest one that's stuck the most is the motivational speaker uh, of the company. So um, I think everybody calls it the evangelist role or whatever. And I'm just like, I like motivational speaker. That sounds a little bit better. Um, so we found a scale computing uh, back now. It's, it's been a decade ago. So it's hard to believe that the you know the company itself has been around for uh, for, for nearly a decade. And so, what is it the that the, the we do at scale? Um, uh, how many people have heard the term hyperconvergence? How many people have been inundated with spam in their inboxes from everybody saying hyperconverge this, hyperconverge that? The reality is, <laughs> me and Jeff Reedy. And analyst Arun Tanaja were sitting in a uh, conference room in Boston in 2011 when we came up with that word. And it's funny because we came up with that word specifically to differentiate ourselves from the other guys who are effectively in hyperconvergence, right? And that's the you probably heard Nutanix and Simplicity and uh, you know and Maxta and you know the, all, all the other guys that, that, that got in there. And so us Nutanix and Simplicity pretty much started that space, but at, the, at that time. Uh, Nutanix and Simplicity were calling themselves the server SAN, which is exactly what their product is, and that's exactly what they did. They took a SAN, they put it in a virtual machine, and they run it on top of some type of hypervisor. And we basically went the complete opposite route, um, where we built this foundational component, and the hypervisor is a piece of it. So what hyperconverged was 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 designed to mean was here's a converged infrastructure that integrates a hypervisor. Right, so hypervisor converged is is effectively the word that then turned into hyperconverged, and uh, and then everybody started doing it. So what is our product? What do we sell? We sell basically appliances that are integrated storage and virtualization, all in a very simple, easy to use uh, form factor. I'll show you a demo uh, a little bit later on uh, uh, about the uh, uh, the product itself. So. A little bit about scale. Like I said, we started the company uh, a decade ago. It's funny, we were just at a show recently, uh, uh, Jeff and I, he's uh, Jeff's uh, one of the other co-founders and, and the CEO, and uh, uh, he's like, when we founded this company a decade ago, and he said, a decade ago, I was like, wow, has it really been that long? And uh, apparently it has. Uh, so, so we've been around a while. Since then, though, um, we, we've got over uh, 2,000 customers, uh, you know, that, that, that are across a variety of verticals, um, including, uh, you know, kind of state and local government. State and local government is, is actually a very big vertical for us. It's probably, um, I think, education, kind of K through 12 education, and then state and local government are, are literally our top two uh, uh, individual verticals that we have. And I think North Carolina is the actually the state where we have got the most installed customers uh, of our product. So if, if y'all look for references, um, those, those are easy for us to find. Um, we are headquartered uh, in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, tech mecca of the world, right? Uh, we're headquartered out there. So I lived in Silicon Valley for 20 years, um, and that's basically where our development office is. Uh, and then I, I recently moved to Austin because it's a place where I could fit in more with my hat. Um, the, uh, but overall, we've got uh, uh, one of the things I want to highlight is uh, kind of that net promoter score. Actually, that uh, slide's a little bit dated. Um, 
net promoter score is, is basically the customer satisfaction rating that we get, and we believe at scale computing uh, that you know the tech support is very much part of the product, as much part of the product as the tin, silicon, and software that we ship. Um, and we have maintained very high customer satisfaction rating, uh, you know, in doing so. So, when we started the company, we had a very specific problem we wanted to fix, and we wanted to fix this problem because we ourselves were suffering from it, and it was the complexity of this modern infrastructure that we were dealing with. So the modern virtualized infrastructure, and when you dial down, what does a modern virtualized infrastructure look like today? It starts off with some type of a shared storage subsystem down at the bottom. SAN, mass, you know, whatever it happens to be. So you go in, it could be NetApp, it could be EMC, it could be, you know, Compel, it could be, you know, free part, you know, insert the uh, insert, uh, SAN vendor here. Uh, the very first thing every uh, SAN vendor does, they, it's, and it's basically, when you think about it, it's just this collection of disks. The very first thing any SAN subsystem does is layer a file system or a pseudo file system on top of whatever it happens to be. Think of that apps like Waffle, right? There's some type of, of abstracted file system that goes on. EMC for doing like you know fancy things like 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 one resizing and all that stuff requires some style of, of file system on that. So you go through, you configure the SAN. You know, then day two you got to configure all the networking. Could be you know if it's a you know it could be a you know brocade fiber channel network. It could be you know iSCSI uh, running on the back end. Day three you can basically stand up your vCenter server and you get those VMware hosts. We're going to pick on VMware today because I like to pick on them. They're the big gorilla in the room, right? When it comes to virtualization. And uh, so day three, you get uh, all those components installed. And now, guess what? Day four, into this implementation, you're at a point where you can actually start implementing those LUNs. And when you think about what is a LUN, what is a, what is a share, on uh, any of these types of systems, it is an object file that is sitting on a file system that is then mapped across that RAID set. And now, guess what? You know, here, so, so we've got this virtualized infrastructure, and now we can start creating VMs. Except we need to take and we've got to map those data stores up through that whole ESX environment. So these data stores get mapped up, and now, What's the very first thing that you know VMware would want to do with that in that environment? Well, VMFS, right? Put a file system on it. So by the time you're ready to create a VM, you got a file system sitting on an object file mapped across a network fabric, sitting on an object file, sitting on a file system, sitting on a RAID set. But you can create that VM. What's that VM in VMware? Well, it's a VMDK, which is guess what? An object file. And then you can actually go in and put that virtual machine on it. And what's the very first thing the guest VM wants to do? Format the file system. So by the time you create the virtual machine up at the top, and you want to do a very, very simple task, like change a period to a comma. And you think about that in the VM. It is no less than seven hops to change a period to a comma because you have an object file sitting on a file system, sitting on an object file, sitting on a file system, sitting on an object file, mapped across the network fabric, sitting on an object file, sitting on a file system, mapped across the RAID set. What could possibly go wrong, right? Now, the, a better way, I was trying to think of a, of, of a really good way to actually diagram what this modern data center looks like, and this is the best one I could come up with. Right? The good old game mousetrap. Now you think about this from an IT perspective. You want to get to root cause analysis? What is it? Maybe the bathtub needs to be kicked a millimeter to the right so that the little ball drops, hits the diving board, the guy flips into the bucket. Also you can do what? Catch the mouse. That's the goal. The goal of IT is catching the mouse. What is catching the mouse? It's keeping those applications running that make the business work, right? When those go down, nothing works. There's an easier way to do that. That's a better job, that does a way better job of, of catching, catching the mouse. One of my uh, all-time favorites, I'm a nerd, I like to geek out on stuff. Uh, 
And one of my favorite RFCs is RFC 1925. The 12 networking truths. And when you actually dive into it, there's a lot, a lot of uh, you know, chunks of wisdom in, in the 12 networking truths. Um, and it was written by Ross Callan when he worked at DAC in like 1994. I think he published this, and it was one of those April Fool's Day RFCs, meant to be a joke. At the same time, there's a lot of little golden nuggets in there. Truth number 12 in the 12 networking <coughs> truths is in protocol design, perfection has not been reached when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So you think about all of these things that can <coughs> fail. You think about that data center built on that. And what could possibly go wrong? Literally almost everything. And one little thing happens in that, and it grinds the, the environment to a halt. So what we did at scale, looking at this, looking at this, like object files on file systems on object files on file systems, that was not efficient. So what we wanted to do was take a clean slate approach. And we removed all of the components involved to the point where the only uh, file system you will even see in a scale uh, environment is the uh, uh, file system that's in the guest OS itself. So it reduces the amount of hops that you take from seven to three to commit anything to disk. So it was all about efficiency, right? There is a better way to do things. And when you think about the same, you think about all the things that go into a modern virtualized environment, none of those were designed for virtualization. A SAN was built to run big shared databases 30 years ago. It wasn't built for virtualization. There are better ways to do these things. And the guys like, you know, the guys at Google, the guys at Amazon took the same approach. They looked at it and they're just like, why would we pay a ton of money to NetApp to basically build something that is effectively not scalable. And, and that's, that's effectively the similar uh, you know, approach that we, the, the we took. One of these quotes, uh, so Rich actually, uh, he wrote uh, this uh, article about a few months ago after we showed him what it was. And kind of the, 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 the big takeaway of this is like, th there's so much hype around hyperconvergence. And uh, I like the fact that he kind of compares it to the smartphone moment. And after seeing what we did, he saw that this is the iPhone moment for hyperconvergence. It's not just taking, you know, it, it, it's not compressing that traditional VM architecture. It's redefining it. And the way we do stuff is significantly different. Now, one of the things I like to highlight is not necessarily, so what do you get with scale? But some of the things, what don't you need with, uh, with basically scale in the HC3 product? There's no VMware, there's no licensing. We designed it to be super simple. So you don't need, you know, there's no PhD required to run this thing. You don't have to send your teams off to weeks and weeks of VMware school to learn how to use it. It's simple. We've got uh, one, of my, one of my systems engineers went home one night. And, and took out his iPhone and, and put a video up on YouTube of his daughter creating a Windows 2008 server. It took her 40 seconds. She's four. She didn't have to go to weeks and weeks of VMware school to learn how to do that, right? It's, a, it's inherently simple. And I'm gonna jump in and show you that, but kind of those core design tenets that uh, that we really focus on are simplicity, high availability, scalability. Now, we've got that performance component in there too. I'll go and show, show you this, but we've got systems that are effectively hybrids that have um, kind of a mix of SSD and spinning media. We also have systems that are full on SSD. We've got a new system coming out um, that, uh, that also is extremely, uh, extremely high capacity. Uh, to the point where we can get uh, you know 100 terabytes of raw storage uh, in uh, one single system. So a three-node system, you can get several hundred terabytes of, uh, of, of capacity out of that. So what you're looking at, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll make this a little bit 
easier for you to read. So this is a three-note system that I've got. Uh, it's literally in my uh, uh, it's, it's in my uh, dining room of my house right now. Um, so I'm so I'm VPN into this. It's a three-note system. Um, what you see, by the way, and from a simplicity perspective, I'm doing this all from my Google Chrome, right? <coughs> so it's just a web browser to administer. Getting it up, uh, getting a cluster up, a three-note cluster up. Uh, we actually did a, uh, a webinar on Spiceworks. It was actually a live on the air. Uh, event it took us 28 minutes from literally opening the boxes, getting them racked, basically cabling everything up, and getting it to a point where you could actually deploy virtual machines in the system. Um, but what you're looking at here, so you'll see up uh, up, up the top, the overall, you got your CPU, memory, and disk utilization, the IOPS uh, utilization. Uh, that is cluster wide, so that is telling you what each one of those individual nodes is doing. These boxes up here are showing the memory footprint of each one of these nodes, and those little uh, slivers that you see here are the actual virtual machines that are actually running on the system. Um, so what I've got down here, then let me actually shrink that just a bit. So all these little like post notes you see down here are the virtual machines that I've got running on the system. And yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is this is one of those ones where I just had to do it because I'm a nerd and I haven't seen it actually boot up in a while. But yeah, here's like Windows 95 running on this because you know why not? Just to see what's uh, what, what's going to be available to run on. Um, so if I want to create a virtual machine in this environment, what I can do? Let's say I'm going to create a new database server, right? And we'll call this a uh, new new DB here. Tag this into the caller group. Pretty much, if it'll run on x86, we can virtualize it. We've actually got a customer that's running uh, uh, OS2 uh, on this as well. Uh, they're a bank. I hope they're not your bank. Um, they have a couple of, uh, of, of OS2 instances. They're doing their cash management stuff still on it. And apparently, the guy retired. They didn't know what to do with it. And they're like, can we virtualize this on this? Let's give it a shot. And, uh, but so you see, you can pick, you know, you want Windows, other, like, so we can go our performance drivers. So we're going to make this a database uh, server. It likes a lot of cores, likes a lot of memory. Let's give this, like, 16 gig of RAM. This is going to be my C drive. Let's say I'm going to put Microsoft SQL on here. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it, uh, you know, 500 gig for the uh, uh, database drive. And let's say it's going to house some images. So I want to give, like, you know, big, like, the two terabyte, or let's, let's do a four terabyte kind of data repository. And then I'm just going to have this, I got this auto installer of Windows 2012, uh, hit create, and basically that's it, VM created. So now when you think about everything that I just did, think about what I didn't have to do. I didn't go in, I didn't provision up a storage subsystem, I didn't carve out the lines, I didn't have to, you know, format VMFS. I simply defined the parameters I wanted for that virtual machine. Everything else is automated. So even the tiering component, uh, is automated, and I'll show you that. Show that to you in a second. So now, if I want to power this virtual machine up, simply just hit the hit the power button. And what it's going to do is uh, we we manage, monitor, uh, and maintain several thousand different conditions on every single node within this cluster. So things like the overall CPU utilization, memory utilization, I/O utilization on the individual nodes is monitored, so it knows where to start that virtual machine up. You'll see it decided to start that on that second node uh, within the cluster. There's our our, our new DB uh, uh, component. Now, if I want to go in and uh, you know let's take a, take a look at this on the console, you'll see we, here we are the wonderful world of uh, installing Windows, right? So all of this is automated. Now, I said I wanted to make this a database server, right? So databases love IOPS, right? As much performance as you can give them, you know, the, the more performance you can give them, the better. So if I actually go in with the disk uh, uh, setup on this system, I've got a single SSD in every one of the nodes across the cluster, and then three spinning disks on every node in the cluster. By default, what is going to happen? So let's say here's my here's my C drive, right? I'm just going to leave that at the default. But let's say this is the this is the database component, right? Database is love IOPS. So what I can do is crank up the flash priority. 
So I can come in here, and anything between 1 and 10, we actually apply this heat map to the data. So we look for the hot blocks, and what we have found in our research uh, on this is that about, uh, uh, I think, 14% of all pretty much workloads has areas of, of hot blocks, right? Which are, you know, data access patterns where it is hit way more than, than you know, the, the, the kind of that data at rest. So we found that overall 14% of that data is, uh, is effectively in the hot spot. So what we can do is we can go in and prioritize then our application. Let's say this is like, you know, it's going to be a database that likes high IOPS. I can go in and I can crank, uh, basically crank these up, you know, all the way to the point of, of ludicrous speed up here at Penn. Uh, and what that does, it applies an exponential weighting to this. So you can prioritize your workloads, your mission critical applications, the things that, that, that are really important to you. That says the more priority, the more SSD it's going to get. And um, like I said, normally you can just set it, it defaults to four, but you can prioritize your workloads. And this gives you a way to do this. Now, I'm doing this live. and. You, like, you don't need to shut the VM down to do it, right? We're still in the middle of you know, installing Windows uh, on this thing. But you know, of course, we couldn't just stop at 10. So we had to basically have a setting where you can crank it to 11, the load the spinal tap here, right? And uh, when you turn it to 11, what I'm doing is saying that this workload, this virtual disk on this VM is all SSD all the time. So if this is my mission critical database, I can say that thing never touches a spinning disk. And this can reside completely 100% in SSD. So I can go in, I can update that. Like I said, this is all done in real time. Now, at the same time, let's say this is, uh, you know, housing like GIS images or something like that. Well, those big, you know, basically the big, the, the big fat files don't need high IOPS. You know, it's all about throughput. And spinning disk does great at at providing that. So what I can do is not only do I have an 11, I can turn it down to zero. That says this disk, these virtual disks never touch SSD. This goes specifically to the spinning disk. So, and you can make these decisions like on a kind of a per virtual disk per VM basis. You don't have to say, oh, this entire one it has these, these characteristics. We wanted this to be as absolutely granular uh, as it could possibly be. And, and we've got the, basically the, the metrics and measurables here on you know, the CPU utilization, the IOP utilization, disk utilization that's going through and doing this. So you can monitor that individually, but then also see cluster-wide you know, what is going on with that. Now, one of the other things that we actually built into this is, is the ability to do uh, uh, basically disaster recovery. So DR from like site A to site B, right? Um, so let's say here's this new database that I'm, I'm setting up. One, we're still going through the installation. It's not even set up. But if I want to actually set this up to replicate to a remote site, there's a couple of things I can do. One, I can select a schedule, or I can just set up replication. I'm going to go ahead and set up a schedule, because that's one of the other things. You can set up your own snapshotting and retention schedule for this. So you know, I'm sitting here using a Mac, and I like that whole uh, time machine style uh, mentality where it's going to, to do the snaps. I'll pull this up here in a second. But I can go ahead and set that snapshotting component up. And what that's actually going to do in this particular case, if I come in and I look at my schedules that I've got set up, and I've got this time machine schedule, what's it going to do? It's going to take a snapshot of that VM uh, once an hour, keep it for a day. So you got 24 snaps that are hourly snaps kept per day. So you can define the snapshotting policy, but also the retention policy. We can do up to 5,000 snapshots per individual VM on the system with, with no performance degradation. So now I've also got it where I've got a daily component, where it takes snapshots once a day, keeps them for a week. Does weeklies, snapshots once a week, keeps them for a month. Do monthlies, keep them for a year. Now, you think about this when, you know, the old WannaCry stuff comes along and you get ransomware, well, guess what? I can actually go into this. Any VM that I've applied this to, and I've got one of my VMs specifically here. Here's my, here's my domain controller. If I go in and take a look at the number of snaps, I've got 40 snapshots created. Those are those hourlies. 
I got all those hourly, so if I got hit by that WannaCry and I want to revert it back to, you know, a daily or an hourly before, I can take and clone that virtual machine out. Here's my clone. That's it. So I can go back, pick any of those point in time. It takes about three seconds for that to come up. I can spin that VM up, and now I'm back up and running. So this is the, the snapshotting capability helps a ton with being able to uh, 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 deal with uh, ransomware threats. Now also, so I defined that schedule for this new database, but let's say I want to replicate this to a remote cluster. So I've got a single node system, it's called Solo, so i got Skywalker and Solo. You might get them probably a Star Wars nerd. Um, so anyway, I want to replicate this to Solo, so I just literally set up DR. This is now going to replicate over to this. And I have, if I actually go over here, here's Solo. And uh, here in a couple of seconds, you're going to see it's going to actually go in. It's going to take that snapshot, and it's going to populate the container uh, at the remote site. Here's the create the replication target. There it is, new DB at that remote site. Now, you'll also notice this is the one I just cloned from, where I had 40 snapshots. So this is at my remote site. Yeah, question. Um, so your DR, your DR node, is that a, just an additional node from your three nodes? Yeah, there? yeah. This is this is actually a single system. This one happens to be sitting in. Uh, so this is in our Indianapolis office. I have a single node system that's sitting in our Indianapolis office, and like I said, this is it in my dining room in Austin, Texas, uh, at Skywalker. Inn. And it's actually replicated this to uh, uh, Indianapolis. And we have two sites in uh -huh. County, and one location yep. already has the three node system set up, and we're mm -hmm. putting the three node system in the other at the other site. Uh -huh. Can I pro provision part of that three node system that at the first site for the so, so you can have basically, so over here on Solo, I don't have any VMs running on it right now, but this single node system, I mean, I can fire up VMs on this just fine. In fact, so here's, here's that domain controller. Um, if I want to take, here, here's, my, here's all my snapshots, but let's say I just want to take the latest snapshot from it. You know, disaster happens. Disaster happens. This is the funny thing. Um, Y'all you, you know this uh, all, all too well, too. Uh, I'm sure, you know. We all want to protect ourselves from like hurricanes and fires and tornadoes and all the bad things that actually happen, right? But nine times out of ten, somebody got crazy with a backhoe out in front of the building, got a fire blank, and now you can't access your data. So, but it's always the most painful thing to deal with is doing a failover scenario. The most painful part of that is the fail back, right? How do you get the data back? And knowing this is a situation where it's you know a temporary outage, with that temporary outage, like it takes AT and T like four days to get there and get everything fixed, you know you're down for four days. Well, this allows you to effectively go over. So here I am at the remote site. I'm going to clone out that domain controller that, that that I've got running on that system. And once again, you know, it takes a few seconds for this to actually spin it out. Um, and then I can actually like fire this thing up. And what I'm going to do, because I need that. let's say I want to test this too, I can go in and uh, let's say put it on my test VLAN. My test VLAN is like VLAN 5, right? Go in here, power this up at the remote site. So that virtual machine, I can power it up. This also gives you a great ability to actually test your DR. This doesn't break any of the replications that are currently going on. I just come that virtual machine out and everything is still replicating just like it always is. So it gives you that ability to test it. Patch Tuesday comes along, and you want to test it. One, you can basically just spin out a direct clone uh, of the system, put it on your test network, test VLAN, patch it uh, on the main system, or you can go to your DR site, right? You've got the capability of doing that. So here this is, this is, this is actually in Fired Up. We've got full uh, VSS snapshot integration with this as well. So, like any of your databases, you want to test it, test integrity, all this stuff. Well, let's say that disaster happens, and it's like, and, and the guy got crazy with the backhoe, and he, and he, and he cut that line. Then at and comes along, and they fix it uh, about two days later. So, how do I fail back? Well, the same way I did the fail over. In fact, I can come in here. So, let's say this has been two days, this thing has been uh, uh, up and running. 
I can come in here, set up replication. I want to replicate that back to Skywalker. So boom, I come over here and then I look at this and you're going to see the, uh, 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 the, the, the clone is actually going to, going to pop over here in, uh, uh, in one second. But the important thing about the way that it's actually doing those snapshot and that cloning component, it finds the latest differentials of those snapshots. So it knows all of the snapshots at each location. So guess what? If this thing is down for two hours, you're sending two hours worth of differentials. If it's two days, you're sending two days worth of differentials, but you're not sending, you know, basically that full load over, over the pipe. So if that's like a two terabyte virtual machine, you're not sending two terabytes, you're sending whatever the differentials were that changed from the last snapshots that actually occurred. So now I did come in, spin this back up, promote that as my primary, good to go. So this is all, all, all fundamental uh, capabilities that, that, that are actually uh, 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 built into the system. There are, uh, there, there are a couple of new things we're working on. I don't really have any slides for this yet. Um, we've got, uh, have y'all heard about this whole like NVMe and uh, 3D cross point and uh, it's all this uh, controllerless based architecture. If you haven't, um, this is where buying a SAN uh, in, so not necessarily today, but 18 months from now, computer architectures are going to fundamentally shift. They're going to fundamentally change. Everything is changing to a controllerless based architecture. NVMe is the thing that's basically leading that charge. Now think about this. You got, here's your CPU. CPUs always talk through a controller to write that one or a zero to a disk in a standard SATA based architecture, in a standard, even when you think of SSDs, they're either SAS or SATA connected today. NVMe drives talk directly to the PCI bus that talk directly to the CPU. What this means and why this is important is uh, there's going to be a fundamental shift in computing architecture in 18 months. And that is the CPU, say you've got 120 cores, 128 threads that you can simultaneously write down to a disk. Every time you run that through uh, a, a PCI bus down into a south bridge, down into some type of uh, uh, SATA or SAS controller, you basically tunnel that down into one thread that that can actually write to. What NVMe does, it allows the CPU to talk 128 threads to 128 threads of NVMe. What does that mean? That means it's really, really fast. So, Controllerless architecture is going to take over computing data centers as we know it. In the lab, we have a system running that is a two-node system with two NVMe drives in each one, and we are sustaining 1.2 million IOPS at a 30 microsecond latency. Now, to think about this, that 30 microseconds, when you think about, you know, Pure is a good example. They have one of the fastest flash storage subsystems out there on the market. Datacore is another one. They are talking two to three milliseconds of latency. We're talking 30 microseconds of latency. And applications fundamentally are going to change and they're going to start changing in about, uh, like I said, about 18 months. You're gonna to start to really see applications change. But the point is, if you're investing in sand based architecture today, you're going to be kicking yourself five years from now because the world is changing over to this new architecture. And in 18 months, it's going to be a heck of a lot more affordable than it is today. But where the roadmaps are going with big companies like Intel and Micron and uh, Mellanox, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a big deal. And when you think about this, and you think about this from an overall cloud perspective, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things I like to say, you know, uh, when, uh, when microseconds matter, cloud's only 88 milliseconds away, right? So for those mission critical applications, there's going to be a fundamental shift in the way server architectures are, are actually working. Now, the, now the beauty of this for us is this is how we architect our solution, right? We saw Intel's, we saw Intel's product roadmap, you know, four years ago. 
and saw this fundamental shift. And one of the big ways in which we're different <coughs> than a lot of the other hyperconverged providers is we built our system from the ground up, meaning we did a lot of foundational work. We built like our entire storage subsystem, our, our entire storage stack is all proprietary, it's our own, we built it from scratch, knowing that this was coming. And that gives us, you know, a pretty good competitive advantage uh, because the other systems don't work that way. They're literally all controller based architectures, every single one of them. And while we were building these foundational components, I always like to say, you know, a funny analogy is like when you, uh, you know, you're going to buy a house, nobody ever goes up to the house and says, wow, look at the foundation of that house. That is one great foundation, right? No, you look at the front door, you look at the facade, you look at all the pretty stuff that's uh, the, those little flashy blinky lights. Uh, we spent a lot of time building the foundation. And uh, that, uh, that, 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 I think that's one of the differentiators of scale uh, when you're talking hyperconverged. We spent a lot of time building that foundation. And, uh, and, and we've got a really, and, and we got a really strong one. Uh, with that, let's see, how much time we got? Oh, we're doing good. Um, I'm going to jump back. Is, is there anything else any, anybody wants to see from the product itself? Yeah. yeah talk about licensing. We're, we're at Workflow Shop. And what uh -huh. was really funny about um, yes, they are. processor affinity on daily assignments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, we can go and you, you can specify processor affinity and do, do it and, you know, uh, uh, all those things. We can go down. Uh, from a licensing perspective, it works just like you would expect it to on like a, like a VMware or anything. So I don't have to license, like if I see a 16 cores, I only have eight cores of license, I can sort of match the... Yep. Yep. You, you can go in and you can find those cores on a, on a per virtual machine basis, so if you've got to run it in there. We've actually got a couple of our uh, uh, partners that really specialize uh, in running Oracle on scale, and, and I'd be happy to hook you up with those guys to, to, to talk them through all the licensing nuances. So like between Microsoft and Oracle, it's... Uh, Licensing is, is, is one of those kind of continual nightmares, and it's funny because about the, about the time you get it figured out, which is six months after you start like trying to figure out what the problem is, like then they'll change the licensing scheme. Microsoft does that all the time, just like like it, it's one of those like if you don't like the way that the Microsoft licensing works, don't worry, it's going to change in six months, and you're going to hate it even more. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we've got uh, we've got a lot of our. Uh, 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 systems engineers and, and, and partners that uh, that can help uh, wade through the, the licensing nightmares that are uh, software licensing. So, any other questions? Yeah. I noticed with the failover and failback it creates multiple VMs. Is there a way to clean that up? And can you set it to where it automatically does failover and failback? We do it manually now, and it's been from customer feedback on why we do it that way. There are automations uh, that we've got in place. One, we've got a full REST-based API uh, behind this, so you can effectively API and script the whole thing out. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of another option. We're actually really working on uh, uh, kind of building out that whole uh, uh, community of third-party applications too that can actually take plug into this and and use those APIs. Anything that I do in the interface, I can do literally from uh, command line or API, and. Uh, We've got a couple of partners that are actually working on doing that right now. Okay, what about cleanup of all the of all the clones? Yeah, I mean, it's honestly it's easy to do too. I mean, from from the whole perspective, I mean, I can literally go in. Example, like here's here's like everything that says clone right now. Uh, I can go in from filtered VMs piece. So all of the filtered VMs, I could go in and say, you know, power them off, shut them down, snapshot them, clone them, delete them. So, so we've got, there's, there's a lot of ways uh, in, in kind of some of just the things within the API itself where you can go in and, you know, define, like, what you want to do. I do this all the time uh, with, uh, so I've got, like, a CRM environment, and I want to clone it out. And the CRM, it's not like, it's not a VM. It's like seven, right, that I've got. And uh, so, so, so I take that, clone the entire thing out, go through, do patch testing, all that stuff on it, and then if everything works, great, and then I can blow them away, and I do that all through uh, basically the whole filtered component. So I can go in, filter those out, and then just select, you know, effectively what I want uh, uh, to, to basically, you know, blow it away, test it, do, do, do all that stuff, so. All right, 
Any other questions? Related to that? Okay. Now, I'm going to do something that is radical in IT. And I actually tell you how much our stuff costs. What? What? <laughs> no. What IT vendor does that? We do. So this is a bit of an eye chart. This is a bit of an eye chart. That box, though, the, 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 the cluster that I was demoing for you is that system right there. So 25,000. Uh, that's all. Of that's three nodes. That uh, includes a year of premium tech support. By the way, we only offer premium tech support. Hope that's good for everybody. Uh, 24 by 7, uh, 365. All of our tech support staff resides in Indianapolis, Indiana. So when you do have a problem, you call us up and you're not going to get asked those questions like you've just been in an auto accident. You're actually going to get, uh, uh, you're going to get someone on the phone that's going to be a tier two, tier three uh, engineer that can fix your problems. Because for us, tech support is as much a part of the pro product as, you know, the tin silicon and software. The, uh, we actually have, uh, well, actually, you get, so in front of you, if you flip that over on the back, those uh, sheets that you've got, that's got the pricing. Our, our, our 1150 is by far the best selling product that we've got because it's a great price point and it's got uh, uh, kind of the tiered SSD component in there. No real rocket science. You take three of those uh, 1150s and you get that price down there. And we aim to keep it, uh, we aim to keep it simple. Simplicity doesn't just apply to the product itself, it applies how, how you, you purchase it. We are a 100% channel company. We only sell for channel partners. If you like big VMRs like CDWs, PC Mall, PC Connection, CDWG, good partner of ours. Uh, we sell a lot through the VMRs. We also sell a lot through uh, uh, kind of the, the, the local, local bars and resellers as well. Um, there's a lot of options you can do to tweak this. If you want 10 gig, we've got a great relationship with, I don't know how much y'all know, Mellanox. Um, great company. Nobody knows about it. Horrible marketing group, right? I don't know what it is about Mellanox, right? The, uh, they primarily sell in the high performance compute. They've got, and I wish I actually had it here, but it's actually off at a, you know, another show. I got this traveling cluster that I, that, that, that I travel with. It's got Mellanox can squeeze 48 ports of 10 gig into half a rack unit. So you can t stick two of these things together and, and have full on, I think, 96 ports of 10 gig in one year. For, and I think each one of those things, those 48 ports is like, it's like $7,000. It's amazingly affordable. Um, but nobody knows about them because they primarily go into high performance compute. Our NVMe stuff all runs with that uh, Mellanox, uh, those Mellanox switchback ends. And uh, those things, they just absolutely scream. Super fast, super reliable. I've been pretty impressed with them. Um, any questions about pricing? Why is it IT vendors never tell you how much their stuff costs? Usually it's like, What's your budget? How much you got? How much is in your wallet? <laughs> the, uh, so a couple of, uh, I want to talk about a couple of case studies. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of the Farm Bureau Insurance. Uh, so they're, they're a customer of ours. So Farm Bureau Insurance. One of the things that they did uh, prior to uh, uh, purchasing us is they went through a three-year TCO analysis. What it would cost them, total cost of ownership, going with a, um, basically their current as-is infrastructure, which was VMware, with the SAN, that 321 architecture that I showed you. Uh, they went through, did the analysis on it, and they came up with buying scale over three years, buying scale will save them 56%. That will give them 500, and $52,000 extra in their budget that they can spend for more pressing issues over VMware, 56%. So Farm Bureau has been a customer for well, about nine months now. And 
what's even more, uh, what's even kind of a more compelling story is, well, let's go to some of our existing customers. So let's talk about, um, here, here was a Saffron, uh, Saffron Aerospace. So Lynn Powers over at Saffron. Let me see. I think I've got Aha, here it is. Now, this doesn't have the, the, the actual thing in here. But. So we talked to Lynn over at Saffron, and he went through this. Now, if you go and you look at these numbers, Lynn's been a customer for like four years. So we asked him, what is your overall TCO savings? by going with us. His number is 56%. 56% savings. So I'm going to make a very direct statement. If you're currently running VMware and you want to save money over three years, I will save you 56% of your IT budget that you can spend for more pressing issues. You can actually get your team working on things that are important to them. Because I'm guessing you've got a to-do list this big, right? But what is your IT department doing most of the time? Probably fighting fires. You know, probably trying to keep that big mousetrap machine running, right? And what are they not doing? That big long list of to-do items that need to get done to make the, to, to, to make the uh, department more efficient. We can help you with that. So with that, we always get asked a lot, how hard is it to migrate? It's not, it's not hard. We do, uh, honestly, that's what uh, our, our tech support team spends most of their time doing. Um, helping migrate from a uh, uh, typically a VMware environment, Hyper-V environment, Zen server environment. We can basically, we've got all the tools all the tools, all the capabilities to migrate you onto the uh, onto the infrastructure, and we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, with that, any more questions? Yeah. So, is it if you buy like a three pack of boxes, uh -huh. they're on the road, you want to add more power? You have to use the same one, or do nope. you go with this model? You can mix and match those. Match. Yeah, because guess what? Yeah, the, the, this is this is one of the things that we wanted to design into it from the from from the beginning. Because guess what? Computer systems change, right? And uh, I know that, that was a big that was a big issue for VMware for quite some time. It's like even if like the like the CPU uh, the specific rev of the CPU didn't match, you couldn't do things like live migrations between them. I've done live migrations. By the way, we've got all that capability too. We can live migrate between nodes, and it's kind of how our upgrade system works. But yes, you can absolutely mix and match. Like I said, we've also got our new systems coming out, those 5150 nodes. If you wanted to take that and put it in, it is funny because that's yet another kind of a random rock reference. You know, we got our turn to 11 and then 5150, a little Van Halen there. Um, but yeah, you can uh, you can absolutely mix and match uh, nodes from different uh, generations. We've actually got one of our uh, uh, customers, this is in Dallas. Uh, he was one of our very first customers, had one of the very first HC3 systems that came out. And he has basically added to it every year, and he now owns literally every SKU that we sell. Um, and it's all in the same cluster. So you can mix and match them. You can also take them, you can decommission them, right? Or you can say, oh, here, I want to start out with these. Okay, here are the new ones come out. You can basically migrate workloads over, say, I want to decommission this. I want to move that to my you know, test and dev environment. I want to move it into a, a DR, right? You can absolutely, you can kind of, Add, remove, and it's all, when you think about this too, it's, it's a very non-disruptive process. So always there's that forklift upgrade. You're like, all right, it's been five years. I need to forklift this stuff out and forklift this stuff in. With these, you can basically mix and match, put new nodes in, live migrate all your workloads, zero downtime, pull those out, put them in DR, put them in test and dev, do whatever you want with them. So it gets rid of that forklift upgrade, which is one of the big uh, problems we wanted to solve. Yeah. So you mentioned application uh, integration earlier. What applications do you integrate with specifically <coughs> those in the backup? Right. Okay. So we're we're full on uh, from an application perspective. We're full on Microsoft Logo certified. So pretty much any applications that run on Microsoft, we can do backup. So we have got 
Um, we've got an offering that we do uh, where, like I said, you can start with a single node and it's overall relatively affordable, right? You're talking about like, you know, 7,500 bucks uh, uh, for, for a single node. You can actually back up directly with the whole DR component. You can back up to that and we have ways to do file level recovery on that. We're working on getting that integrated into the product. Now, with that said, we also work with a multitude of uh, agent-based solutions and we're working with Acronis to get a host-based uh, uh, solution uh, developed. We're expecting that Q1 of next year, uh, the integration with Acronis. The reality is probably by then we're going to have our own integrated backup system that, that, that is going to be built into uh, it as well. And we also are working with Veeam and are partnering with Veeam on their agent-based stuff and they also are interested in doing uh, host-based KVM. Any any agent so so if you use so what do you use now? Well, I mean, we're in the process of looking at changing VMware and some of the other not Veeam, but some of the other. Uh, yeah, there there are solutions that work with Veeam that we can we can work with today. Um, so it, it really kind of comes down to like what what does your environment look like and what you know kind of what backup problems you're trying to solve, and then we we got we got almost two solutions. Other questions? All right. Well, hey, now we got free time. All right. <laughs> Everyone, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, if you got any further questions? Like I said, you've got those. Uh, uh, you got the flyers and stuff. Definitely feel free to reach out to us. Swing by the booth if you want uh, to take a deeper look at anything. Um, yeah, we're here to help. So. Thanks so much. Well, yeah, that was pretty good. Yep.